what I look at ocean acidification is a process of the CO2 dissolving into the ocean and making it more acidic. The oceans are absorbing a high percentage of that, that CO2. Um, it acts as sort of a bank or a reservoir, kind of taking a lot of the CO2 out of the air and into the ocean. Uh, there's a lot of clear effects on hard shell animals, things like corals and mussels, where that increase in acidification um, dissolves away the shells. And it's only recently that people have been realizing that uh, animals that are soft-bodied or animals in their younger stages are also very sensitive to these changes in pH. Ocean acidification can affect squid in a lot of different ways. They have these uh, inner ear bones, these statoliths, which are um, calcium carbonate. So just like our inner ears, their statolith is really, um, really basically a primary balance and orientation structure. So it allows squid to know which way is up or down, um, left or right, um, which way to kind of swim, how fast they're swimming. Um, and if they don't have that, they don't necessarily um, orient correctly. And so uh, we were pretty concerned that the, the uh, ocean acidification might impact that, that statolith. So one of the cool things about this, this project that we have is a partnership in, in a sense with the MBL, the Marine Biological Lab, down the road from us, down the road from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And so um, we, we go out with them to basically catch and sample our squid. What we want to find out right now is what are the squid that are coming in shore to Cape Cod actually experiencing? And what is it like where the eggs are being laid? So what I do is find a, like a school of squid that's come down to mate and take a vertical profile with a temperature sensor, a salinity sensor, and then I will take water samples down that vertical profile of the water column and bring those samples back to the lab to analyze them for carbon content. And with all of that data together, you can calculate what the pH and the CO2 level of the water is. In a lot of ways, the squid are, are sort of um, pretty fragile animals, right? Uh, and so it's important basically to hand select them from the boat so we get really healthy individuals that we can kind of um, encourage to breed in the lab. So once the squid come back to the lab, it usually takes two to three days for an egg mass to appear. So multiple mothers, usually overnight, will lay eggs together in what's called an egg mat. So it's multiple egg sacs all tied together in this sort of mucus net. And once I come in in the morning and see that that's there, I'll take the eggs out uh, and then randomly sort them into these different, like you can almost consider them mini aquaria these little flow-through cups that have different CO2 levels bubbling into them. So we were exposing the squid eggs to multiple levels of CO2 ranging from ambient conditions, which is 400 parts per million uh, atmospheric CO2, to really extreme high levels of CO2, like 2200 parts per million, to see where is the threshold, where is the line after which squid can't deal with this, or you start seeing negative effects. We definitely saw some impacts on the statolith from, from squid or that were raised in high CO2. It's getting just dissolved away, you, you know, even at lower levels of CO2 increases. So like, you know, even at 600 or 800 parts per million levels that we might see in the next 30 or 50 years, we're seeing that specific organ start to degrade. A normal statolith basically starts growing from sort of a center point, sort of grows outwards, um, and kind of puts out um, rings, like, like a tree ring, um, and uh, daily increments. And essentially, in a squid raised in high CO2, we don't see that. So their crystals are laid out in a very disorganized fashion. It's more porous, it more, more looks like a sponge with a lot of holes in it. What we want to find out is, with this degradation of that organ, are they worse swimmers? Are they less capable of escaping predators? In that way, the whole population may be much more severely impacted because the, a lot more of the larvae get consumed and don't come back to produce again. The threshold for really notable impacts on growth and, and uh, development seems to be around 1,500 parts per million, which would be reasonable to expect given current emissions within the next 100-150 years. 
What we're seeing is a reduction in growth with increased CO2 levels and a significant delay in hatching time. So the embryos take longer to hatch from the eggs, which exposes them to predation for longer. We look at all these different parameters so that we can see a, a clear big picture of how the squid's development and growth is affected by these stressful conditions. It all comes together to say, what is the livelihood of these baby squid and what can we assume based on these changes is going to impact them down the road. We're looking at the local market squid, the longfin squid here. So that's the largest uh, uh, squid fishery in Massachusetts. Um, basically, it's, it's about a $40 million a year industry. They're really similar to the, uh, the market squid in California, which is over a $100 million a year fishery. Squid are a primary food source for a lot of marine mammals, a lot of seabirds, a lot of the fishes that we eat, such as uh, tunas and swordfish. There's very few animals that exist, especially animals that humans rely on, that don't at some point in their life either eat squid or get eaten by squid. Every animal has a role in the environment and we need to understand that you know, human impacts are going to shift every animal and that impact on that animal will then spread like a spider web and so we need to be aware that you know, we're impacting it on a major scale and everything that's in it and that's going to come back to bite us if we don't start looking into it. <laughs>